Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is a little bit of a complex case with a ton of different people involved, so it will be a longer video and there will be a lot to discuss. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Rocket Money. Rocket Money is an all-in-one personal finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. For me, I have trouble with budgeting and knowing how to save money or what money to save. It can be so hard for me to track my bills, subscriptions, and anywhere else that my money is going. I'm a huge money saver already, but I know that there are so many different ways that I can be saving even more, and that is where Rocket Money comes in. Rocket Money helps save money in so many different ways. Rocket Money can help cancel unwanted subscriptions by identifying recurring charges and cancel unwanted subscriptions for you with just one tap. It can also help you lower your bills, which I think is a really cool, unique feature. All you have to do is upload a photo by tapping a button and then Rocket Money can negotiate your bills for you from internet service bills to cell phone bills and cable bills as well. Then the other thing I use a lot with Rocket Money is their budgeting feature. Rocket Money sets up budgets that automatically monitor your spending by category and it will give you friendly notifications when you exceed your budget and each month it will give you a visual ratio of where your money was spent. Then you can also set up a smart savings account where you choose the amount and frequency and Rocket Money will automatically deposit savings into a smart savings account where you can withdraw at any time. That is another one of my favorite features. It's really nice having that automatic withdrawal so you don't even have to think about when you're saving money, how much money you're saving, you just know that your money is being saved. It's being saved without you even trying and then you look at your savings account and you're like, oh my goodness, I saved way more than I thought I did. That's what's really cool about that automatic saving feature. So if you want to start saving money and spending less with ease, make sure you use my link down below at rocketmoney.com slash Rachel Shannon to download Rocket Money and unlock more features with premium. Again, make sure you head to rocketmoney.com slash Rachel Shannon to download Rocket Money now. Thank you again so much to Rocket Money for partnering with me on today's video. So this case involves the deaths, unfortunately, of many different individuals who are all connected within a family. So I'm going to start the video with explaining how these individuals in this case connect and who each victim is. Let's start with the Rodin family. So 40-year-old Christopher Rodin Sr. worked as a laborer at Big Bear Lake Family Resort in Lucasville, Ohio. He shared a trailer home with his cousin, 38-year-old Gary Rodin. Gary Rodin was described as being Christopher Sr.'s best friend. Gary was helping Christopher with some alcohol and drug issues, and the trailer that they lived in was located at 4077 Union Hill Road. Christopher Sr.'s ex-wife is 37-year-old Dana Manley Rodin. She worked as a nursing assistant at Hillside Skill Nursing Rehabilitation Center in Peebles, Ohio, which the center is actually now closed. She and Christopher had three children together, 20-year-old Clarence Rodin, who went by Frankie, 19-year-old Hannah Mae Rodin, and 16-year-old Chris Rodin Jr. Dana, Hannah, and Chris Jr. all live together in a trailer at 3122 Union Hill Road, which is just over a mile and a half away from where Chris Sr. and Gary lived. Meanwhile, Frankie and his fiance, they lived in a separate trailer of their own nearby Chris Sr. 20-year-old Frankie worked at a local sawmill and occasionally he worked with his dad at Big Bear Lake Family Resort. He was an avid hunter and fisherman, and he loved going to the Demolition Derby. Frankie was engaged to a 20-year-old named Hannah Hazel Gilly. I know the names are going to get confusing, but bear with me. I will call the Hannahs by their middle names as well, so you can differentiate the two of them. So Frankie had a three-year-old son who was born to another woman, and then Hannah Hazel and Frankie, they had a six-month-old baby boy of their own. Both children lived with them and they were present at the time of the incident. I will discuss more of that later, but Hannah Hazel was described as a doting mother to her six-month-old baby and she described Frankie Rodin as the love of her life. 19-year-old Hannah Mae Rodin worked as a CNA and she was on her way to graduating high school in May of 2016. 
She had two daughters of her own, a two-year-old daughter named Sophia, who was born to a man named Jake Wagner, who she was battling for custody at the time that all of this took place. Then she also had a five-day-old infant named Kylie, who did live with her. We will discuss the fathers of both of these children later in the video. Hannah Mae was described as a loving mother to her two daughters, and she did whatever she could to care for them to the best of her ability. 16-year-old Chris Roden Jr. was a freshman at Piketon High School. He had just recently gotten his driver's license, and again, Hannah Mae, her five-day-old infant, Kylie, Chris Jr., and Dana all lived together in one trailer. 44-year-old Kenneth Roden was Christopher Sr.'s brother. He loved motorcycles, and he was described as a large husky bear of a man. He woke up at 4.30 a.m. every single day and traveled to Columbus, Ohio each day to work his job at a utility company. He lived in a camper located at 799 Left Fork Road, about 15 minutes away from where Christopher Roden Sr. and the rest of the family lived. Now, Dana Manley Roden's sister, Bobby Jo Manley, she was a good friend to the entire family. Chris Sr. had been helping Bobby Joe out because she didn't have a job or any money at the time. So Chris Sr. paid Bobby Joe to come over to their property at 4077 Union Hill Road to help feed their dogs and chickens that they had. They lived on a pretty big property and they took care of different animals and they had a lot of different things going on. So she helped out with that. So on the date of Friday, April 22nd, 2016, that is exactly what she was doing when she stopped over at Chris Sr. and Gary's trailer home. However, on this day, what she discovered was absolutely shocking and completely unexpected. When she arrived to Chris's property, she was immediately thrown off because she saw that the dogs, which belonged inside, they were left outside. Then she noticed that Chris's truck was still in the driveway, which was weird because he was supposed to be at work at this time. But by 7.49 a.m. on that day, Bobby called 911 to report that she had just found her brother-in-law, Chris Sr., and his cousin, Gary, lying on the floor dead in the back rooms of their trailer. Now, when she initially walked into the trailer, she found blood by the front door. In the living room, she found that the recliner had been moved and she found that the rug had been bunched up and there was blood on it. And then they found a trail of blood that led to the back of the trailer, which is where the bedrooms were located. So she went into the bedrooms of the trailer and that is when she found the bodies of her brother-in-law and his cousin. They were lying on the floor of one of the bedrooms with their bodies being covered by a comforter. There was blood absolutely everywhere, and to her, it looked like somebody had beaten the crap out of them. Yes, I need help, Jesse, at 40. Let's go. Come on. Um. I need you to tell me your address. What's the address? Give me just a second. We walked to the mailbox. I think my brother-in-law's dead. Okay, what's, what's the address? Give me just a second. Ma'am, ma'am, you gotta tell me what's going on. There's blood all over the house. Okay. My brother-in-law's in the bedroom. It looks like someone has beat the hell out of him. Okay. There's blood all over the front room. Ma'am, can you tell me what county that's in? Is it Pike County? It's my county? Yes, and they're driving in the bathroom. Okay, okay. I need you to get out of the house. They get driving over there? Yes, I did. Okay, what's your name? My What's your brother-in-law's name? Huh? What's your brother-in-law's name? Okay. 
I need you to get out of the house and wait. I'm down now. Okay. I'm staying outside right now. Okay. Just stay out of the house. Don't let anybody go in there, okay? Yeah. All right. We got deputies on the way, okay? Uh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> As Bobby Jo had just discovered the bodies of her brother-in-law and his cousin, Bobby Jo and Dana's brother, James Manley, I guess he happened to pull up to the home to check on Bobby Jo since she had been gone for a while and he knew that she would be there because, again, she went there every morning to feed the livestock. But just as he got there, he saw Bobby Jo jump in her truck and drive away. He said that he could tell just by the way that she drove her truck that something horrible had happened. So he immediately got back into his vehicle and followed behind her. So Bobby Jo, with James following behind, went over to the other trailer at 3122 Union Hill Road to tell them what happened. But when they got there, they knocked on the door and Frankie's three-year-old son was the one who answered the door. Immediately, the little boy told Bobby Joe that daddy has a lot of blood. So she went inside and into the bedrooms. Frankie and his fiance, Hannah Hazel, were found lying in their beds, covered in blood with their six-month-old infant lying in between them. And thankfully, the baby boy was not harmed, but he was covered in the blood of his parents. And thankfully, again, the three-year-old boy also was not harmed. After finding the bodies of their nephew and soon-to-be niece, as well as their brother-in-law and his cousin, Bobby Joe and James hopped back in their trucks to go over to Dana's trailer to now tell her what happened. When they got there, they found that the door had already been opened. They called Dana's name, but they got no response. They said that they then walked straight back to Dana's room, past Hannah Mae and Chris Jr.'s room, and that is when they found that Dana's room was dark and they couldn't tell whether Dana was in her room asleep or not. So, James went over to her bed and felt around the bed for Dana, and when he felt her, he started to pat her and roll her over to wake her up, but she was not moving. He tried to pull the pillow out from under his head, but it was stuck. At that point, James said that he pretty much just turned around and left the room because he knew that his sister was dead because the pillow was stuck under her head and she was not moving. He didn't see her physically at that time, but I imagine if you feel someone and they feel like they're not living, you probably don't want to turn the light on to see that person dead in their bed. So that's kind of what he said happened there. As James was walking out of the home, he did hear cries coming from five-day-old Kylie, but he couldn't bring himself to look around the trailer anymore. So he left the property and then went home to get his wife and then returned back to the trailer to go get Kylie out of the home but James and his wife just could not get themselves to go back inside of that trailer, not knowing what happened, but knowing that Dana seemed to be like she was dead. So they actually flagged down the police who were on their way to the other properties after those bodies had been found and after they had called 911. And that is when they got the police to come over, the police went inside, and they found that not only was Dana dead, but so were Chris Jr. and Hannah May. All of them were lying in their beds, absolutely covered in blood. And Hannah's five-day-old infant, Kylie, was in bed next to her mom with her diaper soaked in Hannah's blood. Then, like I said earlier, Hannah May's three-year-old daughter, Sophie, was also unharmed because she was not at the trailer at the time. She was in custody of her father at this time. Then, after finding the bodies of these seven different family members, James just had a feeling that this might not have gone well for the entire Roden family. So, James went over to Kenneth's trailer, again located 15 minutes away at 799 Left Fork Road to go ahead and check on him. And by 1.26 p.m. that same day, 911 received another call to report that an eighth body had been found. Kenneth had also been found dead in his trailer. This is 911. Can I help you? Yeah, I need a, a deputy to come out to close to... Okay. 
uh, it's all this stuff that's on the news. Uh, my, I just found just found my cousin with a gunshot wound. Okay, sir, is he still alive? No, no. Okay, and you're. Now I don't know what his address is. He don't. He don't have a box. He don't have a box. Okay. I'll be standing out by the road waiting on him. What's your name, sir? What's his name? Kenneth Roden. Kenneth Roden. Yeah. Okay, sir. Are you out of the house? I'm out. I'm out of the house right now. I just went in, uh, hollering at him, and checked his all right now. And I looked up at him. He had a gunshot wound. Okay, sir. We're gonna get that to you after you, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. Of course, police were dispatched to these four trailers to investigate exactly what was going on here. When investigating inside the trailer of Hannah Hazel and Frankie, they determined that neither the front door nor the back door had any signs of damage or forced entry. Inside the home, the TV was still on, the nightlight was still on, and there were clothes and toys spread all throughout the trailer. Then they found that there was moss growing on the outside of the sliding glass door on the side of the trailer. That moss did look like it had been disturbed beneath the window. Then there looked to be grass found on top of an air conditioning unit located right below the window outside, and there was a knife jammed into the window frame as well. However, there was a lot of clutter and items right in front of the window, including like a little nursery for chicks with lights, and then a bunch of like nursery stuff all around, and then just other random items with clutter. So this made it seem like if someone had stepped through the window to enter the home, it seems like some of these items would have been disturbed, but they weren't. So it kind of seems like either they didn't climb through the window to gain entry into the home, or if they did climb through that window to gain entry, they knew those items were there and they knew to work around them as to not disturb them. Then the bodies of Frankie and Hannah Hazel were found lying in their beds with apparent gunshot wounds to their heads and no other apparent injuries. Autopsies would later discover that Frankie was shot three times in his head, which appeared to be made at intermediate distance, meaning it seemed to be within three feet away. And then Hannah Hazel was shot five times in her face and head at close range, between three inches and three feet away. Hannah Hazel appeared to have blood smears on her chest and other swipe marks on her body, which investigators said was from the baby moving around and trying to climb on her mother after she had been shot, which is just devastating. Hannah Hazel was also found wearing a nursing bra that was unclipped on one side, which told investigators that she may have been nursing her baby when she was shot to death. Once their bodies were removed from the home and sent to the medical examiner's office, Investigators found five different cartridge casings from a rim strike bullet in or near the bed where they were shot, and on those bullets, they saw the letters REM stamped on the end, meaning that they were Remington brand bullets. Across the room near the bedroom door, they found another bullet on the ground, but this was still a live, unfired round, which had markings that showed that it belonged to a different brand, meaning that there was more than one gun used in this crime, or at least present at this crime. After the autopsy, investigators determined that Hannah Hazel and Frankie had been shot with a 22 caliber gun, both at relatively close range. Then, the other autopsies for Dana found that she was shot five times in her head, Hannah May was found shot two times in her head, and Chris Roden Jr. had been shot four times to his head, with two shots being to the very top of his head. Then, Kenneth Roden was found to have been shot one time in the right eye. Gary Roden was found to have been shot three times in the head, being described as being in close range, while Chris Sr. actually had the worst injuries. He had injuries that indicated that he fought with his attacker, 
and he ended up being shot nine times to his head, torso, and arms. The medical examiner believes that Gary and Chris Sr. were actually murdered at around 11 p.m. on Thursday, April 21st, the night before their bodies were found. Most family members were thought to have been killed while they were sleeping, with a few exceptions that I will discuss later, in an execution-style shooting. They were all thought to have been killed in the middle of the night, starting late April 21st, going into April 22nd, 2016. Now, most of the forensic evidence and blood evidence that police focused on was the evidence found in Gary and Chris Sr.'s property. At the home that Gary and Chris Sr. lived in, it was on a larger property in a rural area. Around the trailer, there were several cars, a lot of land, a semi-truck, and a shed. Within the home of Gary and Chris Sr., investigators found patterns of blood spatter and stains all throughout the trailer, including on the ceilings. They believed that blood evidence showed that at least one of the bodies believed to be Chris Sr.'s was originally shot in the living room and then moved for a final time to the bedroom where they were ultimately found. Blood evidence also showed multiple shoe prints where someone tracked blood all throughout the trailer, including near a path of blood, which showed that the person was walking along the path as they dragged the body from the living room to the kitchen and then to the bedroom. Then they said that they found bullet holes within the door frame that leads into the trailer and in the walls of the trailer, which made investigators believe that the door was probably open when someone started which made investigators believe that the door was probably open when someone started firing from the door area on the front porch. Then they found several bullets or bullet fragments within the living room, bedroom, on the front porch, and then one in the kitchen. Then, despite Bobby Joe saying that the recliner in the living room had been moved, Investigators said that they found no other evidence of a struggle within the home. They found no knocked over furniture, no displaced photos or wall hangings. They also swabbed for DNA from the doorknob of the home, various areas of blood pooling or spatter, items of clothing found within the home, as well as the bullets that they found but none of that DNA came back with a hit. Then, on a different building at the property, police found a door with the handle broken off, so that door was now, like, stuck open. Above the door on the outside, there was a wall-mounted surveillance camera. They saw that the cables from this camera led inside of this building, which were attached to other cameras, which were also supposed to be connected to some sort of recording device to store the data from what the cameras had picked up. But police found that all of the wires were unhooked and there was no recording device. So, it looked like whoever broke in and entered knew about this camera, and to avoid being captured on film, they took the recording device. Police did take DNA from several other areas outside of the main trailer, such as these cords, the cameras, a Mountain Dew bottle that they had found, as well as cigarette butts that were found outside, but all of the DNA that they found was just coming back as belonging to the victims, they were not able to identify a perpetrator with any of this DNA. Then, upon searching the property around the trailer, investigators discovered three sites spread among four locations, which police described as marijuana grow operations. They said that they found a sophisticated marijuana grow site across the three properties that investigators said was obvious that they were growing to sell. They weren't just growing marijuana in a garden in their home for their own personal use. It was clear that they were involved in some sort of criminal activity and that they were selling this marijuana. So, the first theory that investigators pondered was whether these killings could be related to a drug cartel. Did the family have cartel connections that they needed to look into? Was there an issue with drug dealing gone wrong here? they weren't totally sure of what to make of this. They did find evidence that made them believe that there may have been more than one shooter involved in this, once again, due to the different type of bullets and bullet casings found at the crime scenes and within the victims. But by October of 2016, police announced that they no longer believed that this was any sort of cartel-style killing. 
This was like an execution style killing. And again, with the marijuana grow, they thought that this was a possibility for a few months there. But now they believed that whoever was responsible, that they were locals to the area. They said that the killers had to be familiar with the land around the properties as well as the properties themselves based on the evidence that they found. But after announcing this, months passed and police seemed like they just weren't getting anywhere. They couldn't find any usable DNA evidence. They had all of this blood evidence and bullet casings and they literally had this entire scene that told a story of exactly what happened. They literally had four different crime scenes to work with but they just weren't getting anywhere and people in this small rural area were getting antsy. Police warned that the people that did this were still out there and because they didn't have a motive, they wanted people to remain vigilant and keep on the lookout to make sure that they weren't the next ones victimized. But by June of 2017, Police went to the public to ask them for information about any sort of interactions, conversations, dealings, or transactions that they may have had with four different members of the Wagner family. The members of this family mentioned by police were 47-year-old George Wagner III, who went by Billy, his wife, 48-year-old Angela Wagner, and their two children, 27-year-old George Wagner IV, and 26-year-old Edward Wagner, who went by Jake. As I briefly mentioned before, Jake Wagner is the father of Hannah Mae Roden's daughter, Sophie, and at the time, they were going through a custody battle for Sophie. Police asked the public for information regarding any interactions with the members of this family, specifically regarding information on vehicles, firearms, and ammunition. Now, a little bit more about Jake and Hannah Mae's relationship. Hannah Mae met Jake when she was 13 years old and Jake was 18 years old. So already, red flag city. A legal adult preying on a 13-year-old girl. You can argue with me all you want, but an 18-year-old with a 13-year-old is wrong. And it's, it is grooming, in my opinion, and in a lot of opinions. I think that that is absolutely wrong and that is not okay. But either way, by the time Hannah Mae was 15 years old, she was pregnant with Sophie. Shortly after Sophie was born, Hannah Mae and Jake did break up. Family members of Hannah's allege that there was abuse happening from Jake to Hannah during their relationship. There is a little bit of proof to this, but obviously Jake denies this. Then it turned out that there were questions regarding the paternity of Hannah's newborn, Kylie. So, as we know, Hannah Hazel Gilly is the fiance of Frankie Roden, Hannah May's brother. But Hannah Hazel's brother, Charlie Gilly, also dated Hannah May Roden. So, he said that there was basically a 50-50 chance that Kylie belonged to him, while Jake Wagner said that there was a 50-50 chance that Kylie belonged to him. Both men took paternity tests and it came back that Charlie Gilly is Kylie's biological father. According to court documents, the Roden family said that the Wagner family tried to get Hannah Mae to sign away her parental rights of Sophie to Jake just weeks before her murder. Then, 19 days before the murders, Jake's maternal grandmother, Rita Newcomb, she allegedly forged a custody document in the case. During the whole custody battle, Jake alleged that Sophie was being abused during the times that she was with her mother. Now, the family originally lived on a property on Peterson Road in Peebles, Ohio, located about 15 miles away from where the Rodens all lived. But after the murders took place, the entire family up and left, moving all the way to Alaska. They said that they were very close with the Roden family. They saw Hannah as a daughter and Chris Sr. as a brother. They said that they were all just devastated from the murders and they moved away because they're trying to move on from all of it. But as the investigation continued with the Wagners, police discovered that the custody battle between Jake and Hannah Mae was even more intense than they originally thought. Going back all the way to November of 2013, Jake was insistent on Hannah moving in with his family and raising Sophie with him and his family, but she refused. Hannah saw Jake trying to get her to live with him and his family as a way to control her. Jake wrote in one text, quote, 
Hannah, I'm telling you right now to make a choice and make it now. If you do this, it's over. I'll take Sophie and if I have to, by force. I love you with all my heart. If you love me and Sophie, you will make the right choice. I want you to live with me and Sophie. That don't mean that we have to stay at my house all the time, but she will live wherever I am. He told Hannah that he's not trying to control her, that he wanted to build a house and that he needs a job. He said that he's not living with Hannah and her brother because, quote, at least no one at my house would hurt a baby or you, so I'm living at my place till I build a house with Sophie. You can live with me. If someone freaks out, we will leave and come back when it's calmed down. These types of conversations continued over the next two years with Hannah continuously refusing to live with Jake and his family. By March of 2015, Hannah texted Jake saying, I don't want to be with you. You hurt me. It was alleged that Jake had threatened Hannah, chased her, and strangled her at one point. It was thought that he even threatened to kill her, saying that he would, quote, put her body where it would never be found. After that, that is when the couple split up. Jake tried to get Hannah to sign papers, which would mean that she would split custody with him, Jake, and his brother, George, for whatever reason, but she refused to sign these papers. She wrote in one Facebook message to a friend in December of 2015, saying, they will have to kill me first, regarding him having full custody of their daughter. Others who knew the Wagner family described them as a very close family who lived together their entire lives. They worked together, they were homeschooled together, and they commingled their money together and voted as a group over everything. Now, like I said, about a year before the murders in June of 2017, that is when police asked the public for help with information regarding the Wagner family but they didn't name them suspects or anything like that at that time. However, by November 13th, 2018, police announced that they finally had made arrests in connection to the horrific murders. Police announced that they actually arrested six members of the Wagner family, all for their alleged connection to the Roden family murders, which was eventually being called the Pike County Massacre. They released the indictments, which charged four members of the Wagner family, including 47-year-old Billy Wagner, 48-year-old Angela Wagner, 27-year-old George Wagner IV, and 26-year-old Jake Wagner on charges of aggravated murder. Then they arrested 66-year-old Rita Newcomb, Angela's mother, and 77-year-old Frederico Wagner, Billy Wagner's mother, with charges of obstructing justice and perjury. Police alleged that the family all worked together to murder the members of the Roden family all over this custody battle with Sophie. Police alleged that Jake became obsessed with having custody of Sophie. It got to the point where he just wanted full control over Sophie and Hannah, and he would not see it any other way. That is what is being alleged here. It was said that the entire family talked about the plan. They all voted on it together and ultimately decided to carry it out. Police showed that Angela actually hacked into Hannah's Facebook account, which showed the message that Hannah sent to another family friend, which said that the Wagners would have to kill her before she would ever relinquish custody of her daughter. It showed that Angela had actually been like hacking into their accounts and reading their messages and saying what they were doing for quite some time before she even saw that message. It was alleged that after that, that is when there was this family vote. Then the family spent the next four months methodically planning out the executions of eight family members so they could all guarantee that the Wagner family would get custody of Sophie. Based on that, police were able to obtain a search warrant for the Wagner property. Based on their findings, police alleged that each different family member played a different role in the plan to murder the rodents. They said that Angela went to the store to get her son's new athletic shoes to wear during the killings, probably so that they could get rid of them and not be connected to any of their current shoes that they owned, so that should they leave footprints, which as we know, they did, you know, they weren't able to track down the shoe prints or whatever they thought would come out of buying new shoes, but police were able to track down the shoes that Angela bought from Walmart 
and they did match those shoe prints to the prints that they found in the blood within the home. So I don't believe that they were able to find the shoes that they actually wore to like physically see them, but they were able to go to that Walmart, find out what shoes they bought, and those were a match to the prints that were found within the rodents' properties. George Wagner also bought a new truck that they would specifically only use on the night of the murders so that they could avoid detection, and so, like, the truck wouldn't be connected to a truck that they were already known to have, so, like, if people in the community saw them driving this truck, let's say at, like, 1 a.m. after committing the murders, that no one could be, like, an eyewitness and be like, hey, I saw the Wagner's truck driving on this road at this time, and that was suspicious. That's why they bought this brand new truck. So, the family started by tracking and studying all of the habits and movements and routines that each member of the Rodin family had, and they studied the layouts of their homes and surrounding properties. The sons had also bought guns and practiced shooting them to see if the shots could be heard from a distance, and if so, how far away the shots could be heard. So, police were able to search the trees around their property, and they found several trees with bullet fragments in them, which matched the bullets that were found at the rodents' homes. Then, in March of 2016, the month before the murders, Jake went and bought silencer parts to build silencers to use during the killings, which again, he did use. They bought ammo, magazine clips, brass catchers, and even a bug detector to prepare for the murders. They studied any surveillance that the properties had, including the pets at the home, the video surveillance, and they tampered with home security systems and even cut their phone lines. Then, police found three different weapons within the Wagner home that the family attempted to cut into pieces and burn before ultimately burying them in cement within five-gallon buckets that they then hid in the pond behind their property. A special firearms examiner was able to extract the pieces of these guns out of the buckets. He reconstructed them and tested them. The casings from these guns did match the shell casings that were found at the home. Then, police found out that Jake and George both hid in the truck together on the night of the murders, while they allege that Billy went into the home of Chris Roden Sr. Apparently, Billy went into Chris's home under the guise of doing some sort of drug deal. Then, when, you know, the family got there, Chris was obviously expecting to only see Billy there, but instead, Jake, George, and Billy all ambushed him after hiding out in the truck. So, using all of that evidence, police were able to make arrests. Now, the Wagner family had actually moved back to the continental U.S. in 2018, so by November 13th, 2018, the six members of the Wagner family suspected of involvement, they were all arrested. By November 28th, 2018, George entered a plea of not guilty, and in December of 2018, Billy also pled not guilty. Each man was being charged with 22 different charges. In June of 2019, the state decided to drop the charges against Billy's mother, Frederica. They originally alleged that she had lied to a grand jury after it's believed that she hid two bulletproof vests that they think were worn by the Wagners as they murdered the rodents that night. Frederica said in her statement that she actually bought these vests after the murders to protect her family, but police couldn't find any proof of the purchase from Amazon, which is where she said she originally bought them. But eventually, she was able to provide receipts from eBay, which is where she actually bought them, which did confirm that she bought them after the rodents had died so these charges were dropped. Then, as I mentioned, Rita Newcomb was also arrested. She was being charged with perjury, obstruction of justice, and forgery. She was accused of forging and notarizing custody documents for Jake, but the state used handwriting analysis to prove that she was the one who signed Hannah's name. For this, she did enter a plea deal with the prosecution in December of 2019. The other family members remained behind bars, maintaining their silence for two and a half years. During those years, Jake and his mother adamantly denied involvement in the killings, expressing grief and sorrow for the loss of the Roden family. They said over and over and over again that all they wanted was for the real murderers to be caught. 
they said that the rodents were their friends, that Chris Sr. and Billy were like brothers, and that Hannah Mae was like a daughter to Angela. That was before they broke their silence in April of 2021, which came as a huge shock to everybody involved. At that time, both Jake and Angela offered a statement in which prosecutors cannot use for any future criminal proceedings. It can only be used at the trial for the other family members that are involved. In exchange for this, Jake pled guilty to all 23 charges that he was being charged with, and he agreed to testify against his other family members. He agreed to testify as long as his brother and dad would not face the death penalty if they were convicted. So, Jake told the prosecutors that he was responsible for five of the eight murders, but he did plead guilty to involvement with all eight murders. He was able to cooperate evidence, leading prosecutors to the truck that George had purchased to be used solely on the night of the murders. He also led them to the guns that I discussed they found earlier that were within these, you know, cement blocks. In addition to the eight counts of murder, he also pled guilty to the following felony conspiracy, aggravated burglary, unlawful possession of a dangerous ordinance, tampering with evidence, forgery, unauthorized use of property, interception of wire and oral communications, obstruction of justice, engaging in a pattern of corrupt activity, unlawful sexual conduct with a minor, Hannah Mae Roden, who was 13 years old when the relationship began, I'm very thankful that he was charged with this. Because of all of these charges, he was sentenced to eight consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. Then in September of 2021, prosecutors dropped the eight murder charges against Angela, saying that she was at home with her two grandchildren at the time when the murders were committed. So instead, she pled guilty to charges of conspiracy, aggravated burglary, tampering with evidence, forgery, unauthorized use of property, and unlawful possession of a dangerous ordinance. In exchange for her guilty plea, Angela was sentenced to 30 years behind bars, and she will have to testify against her family members at trial. So, the trial for murder for George IV started on September 12th, 2022. The prosecutors talked in detail about all of the things that the Wagner family were involved with together before the murders. They had various criminal enterprises, including drug dealing, small and large-scale theft, arson, metal scrapping, and gun sales. All of the members of the Wagner family worked on this together. Then, they all worked together on another crime, murdering the Roden family. They wanted to gain sole custody of Sophie. In the trial, Jake testified in a very matter-of-fact way. He said that he felt like he had no choice but to kill Hannah. He said that after killing Hannah, they had to kill her brother and her father as well as her uncle because Billy Wagner feared that these men would get revenge on them for Hannah's death. The other victims were killed for the sole reason that they happened to be home and they would be witnesses to the crimes. Jake said that after assembling the gun silencers, buying a phone jammer, earlier I said they cut the phone lines, but I mean like they made it impossible for them to like use their phones while they were there. They also got a bug detector to see if like, you know, there was any bugs in the house to make sure that they wouldn't be caught on video or I guess audio. And then they also hacked into their social media accounts. Jake, his brother George, and their father Billy all drove to Chris Sr.'s home where they began killing them. Jake said that the plan was for George to kill Chris Sr. with a rifle, but when they got there, he would not fire. So Jake grabbed the gun and he fired instead. Jake went on to say that he killed five of the victims with a 22 Walther Colt 1911 handgun, while his father, Billy, killed three family members with a 40 caliber Glock. He said that George actually did not kill anybody. The prosecution argued, though, that even if George did not physically kill anybody, he still was complicit in the planning, execution, and cover-up of the murders, and Ohio law dictates that complicity does make him guilty in these killings. George actually took the witness stand himself, and he said that he did not have any knowledge of the murders before, during, or after the killings. He said that if his family asked him to be involved with such a thing, he would never do it. He was involved with theft, but he would never think that his family is capable of something like murder, especially of eight people. Of course, the prosecution discussed all of the evidence that we discussed earlier, 
the bullets, the shoe prints, the, you know, hacking the messages, the truck, the guns, all of that. The trial for murder lasted almost three months, and after that, the jury finally went in for their deliberations. The jury deliberated for less than a day before they came back with their verdict, they found George Wagner IV guilty on all 22 charges, including the eight charges of aggravated murder. For this, he was given life in prison without the possibility of parole, as well as 81 years for the firearm charges to be served consecutively. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? Yes. Right. Would the foreman please, or foreperson please hand the verdict forms to the bailiff here? Verdict as to count one, it says, we the jury find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, George Washington Wagner IV, is guilty of aggravated murder as charged in count one of the indictment. It says, uh, we the jury further find that the state of Ohio did prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, while committing the uh, murder as charged in count one, have a firearm on or about his person or under his control, as alleged in count one, uh, and specification one to count one. It says we uh, uh, further find that the state of Ohio did prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant displayed the firearm, indicated that he possessed the firearm or used the firearm to facilitate the said offense of aggravated murder as charged in count one of the indictment as alleged in specification two to count one. It says we further find that the state of Ohio did prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the firearm uh, the defendant had on or about his person or under his control while committing the offense of aggravated murder as charged in count one of the indictment was equipped with a firearm muffler or suppressor as alleged in specification three to count one. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is that your verdict? Yes. Verdict as to count five, we the jury uh, find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant George Washington Wagner IV is guilty of aggravated murder as charged in count five of the indictment all three specifications as to count five are also found to be true. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is that your verdict? Yes. And is, and is ready to uh, impose sentence. So, Mr. Wagner, I'll ask you to stand at this point. On count one of the indictment for the offense of aggravated murder in violation of section 2903.01a of the revised code, the victim of that offense being Kenneth Roden, the court hereby sentences you to serve a mandatory term of life imprisonment without parole. Upon count two of the indictment, the victim of the offense being um, Chris Roden Sr. And again, the, the charge is aggravated murder and I've given the section number. In fact, all of these first eight offenses involve the crime of aggravated murder set separate victims in violation of 2903.01a of the revised code. After the sentencing, several family members and friends of the Rodins all took the stand to make their statements about just how senseless of a crime this was and how it destroyed their entire family. I hope every night when you close your eyes, you see them eight faces and I hope they haunt you. They don't want to die. How ironic is that? Well, karma drives a big bus and you will eventually reap what you have been sown and you will pay the price for what you have done. As for Billy Wagner, his trial is actually not expected to start until early 2024, but as of right now, he has maintained his innocence. So I guess we will have to wait and see what comes of the trial, but I am expecting the same outcome, especially given that Jake pointed to him as being like the one who pulled the trigger for three of the murders. So that is all of the information that we have on this case at this point. I do know that the three small children involved in all of this have been given to family members and for the sake of their privacy, I don't think police have announced who they are with but they assured the public that those children are safe and happy with the environments that they are now in. But either way, I'm really looking forward to your thoughts on this case. I think it's crazy just how much planning went into this murder only for it to be executed so sloppily. I think that the whole idea that this entire murder of eight people was over a custody agreement is just insane, but I can definitely see how that's the actual motive. Like, I don't think that there's some 
other secret motive here. I do think that Jake was obsessed with getting custody of Sophie and he just wanted to control everything in his life. And I think the family just supported him for whatever reason and they felt that he deserved custody for whatever reason. Obviously, the family is going to believe their own family member. So, I think that if Jake was telling his parents and other family members that like Hannah and the Roden family are abusing Sophie, that they would believe him and that maybe they really thought that Sophie being in her custody was going to harm her or maybe they just really wanted this control but I cannot understand how the entire family was just on board with this entire thing. It's definitely one of those cases that we hear of of like madness of the entire family of one person going mad and the rest of them just sort of follow suit. And with this, I know that they said that the rest of Hannah's family was just collateral, that, you know, Hannah was the target, but they killed her brother and her father and her uncle because they didn't want them to get revenge. But I also think that if there was a family member still living and they were caught for being involved, that one of the rodents would have been the one to get custody of Sophie. So I honestly think that that is another reason why they chose to kill all of them except the children. Because really, if they can sneak in in the middle of the night and not be detected until the next morning when someone finds the body, there was absolutely no reason to kill any of the other members of the family. I mean, obviously, there was no reason to kill them in the first place, but I honestly don't think that they killed, like, Hannah, Hazel, and Frankie because they were afraid of being caught. I genuinely think that they went out of their way to go to all of these different properties to kill every member of the family because they knew that there was a possibility that they could be caught and if they were caught that the rodents would obviously have custody of Sophie and the other child. I think it's sick that Jake, who at one point literally thought that the five-day-old infant was his, literally shot that baby's mother in front of that baby and just left her there in the mother's blood. And I do believe that the children suffered from ruptured eardrums because of the blasts and I'm sure that they will be traumatized for the rest of their lives even at five days old. You can't just live through something like that and be okay. Like, I don't think she will specifically remember it even if nobody tells her that her parents were murdered in the way that they were but I guarantee that for her entire life, she will just know in the back of her head that something happened. There are actually studies to show that if children are traumatized even at that young, it leaves permanent scars on them for the rest of their lives, even if they have no idea why, which honestly can even be more frustrating if you just know like, or you're a certain way or you have mental health issues because you went through something and you have no idea what you went through. I can imagine how that's like literally so frustrating. She might not know for sure that she was even there when her mother was killed, but she will have trauma and so will that six-month-old and so will that three-year-old. They did not deserve to lose their parents and watch them be murdered right in front of their faces. And if Hannah really was breastfeeding her child at the time that she was murdered, that just takes this entire thing to a whole nother level of deranged. Again, I don't think there was any reason for Jake to go after Hannah's brother and his fiance. That part is just sick to me. All of this is just horrible. I honestly think that it's clear that Jake is just a controlling little douche who just wanted control over Sophie and Hannah and that's it. I think that's why this entire thing happened. It's insane, again, that the entire family, including those old women, were just okay with murdering an entire family because I know that Frederica and Rita knew. They had to know. They knew, and I don't know if they were involved in the planning or any of the cover-up. They probably weren't, but they knew. I know for a fact that they knew. Even if they say they didn't, I know they knew. It's just so sick. The entire case is really horrible and despicable, but now I honestly want to know what you guys think. What do you think of Jake taking a plea deal and testifying against his family? What do you think about the same with Angela? What do you think about them dropping the murder charges against Angela? Do you think that George should have been convicted of murder even if he didn't pull the trigger? And how do you think Billy's trial is going to go? Let me know these and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. 
make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And I actually do now have a Facebook page that you guys can all follow. It's at Rachel Shannon, and that will also be linked down below. I'm so excited. It's brand new. It shares a lot of the cases in short form videos. It's really nice because a lot of the cases that I've covered, as well as videos that I will be covering in the future, are posted to that Facebook in shorter form videos so that you can get the entire case in a shorter form without all the details if that's what you're into or if you just want a recap of a case that I've covered in the past or if you want a recap of a case that you just watched without all the details it's great for that as well. So make sure you go ahead and check out my Facebook page as well. I'm very excited about it. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.